So tonight, uh, I'm actually really excited. I think of all the events that we've done so far, tonight is really going to be one of the ones that's most valuable and impactful for all of us in here. Uh, the original topic was starting an e-commerce business, and we're certainly going to focus on that. But one of the pieces of feedback that I got, and a lot of things that I heard from a lot of you in you know, talking to you after each time, was, look, you know, um, I may not have a business that I'm going to raise a lot of money for. And we spent a lot of time talking about venture capitalists and angel investments. And that's great if that's the route you're going to go. But just statistically speaking, most of us aren't probably going to raise money for the businesses that we start. And that doesn't mean that they can't and won't be wildly successful and make you a whole lot more money than had you gone out and raised money. And so one of the advantages of e-commerce is it's a platform to help you build a business to make, start making money right away. And so what I want to do to, tonight is bring together a group of speakers um, that are just really great entrepreneurs and have built e-commerce businesses, but also, I think more importantly, have built businesses where they didn't have to go out and raise money uh, up front. And it started making money, it provided them really great lifestyles and helped them build even more businesses. And one of the things that I think is awesome about each of these guys is they just got that kind of hustle factor. And you've heard me say a lot of times, I don't think there's anything special or different or unique about anything that I've done or a lot of us have done to be successful. It's just doing those things that maybe other people aren't willing to do. And I think each three of these fellows tonight are amazing examples of that. Um, so without wasting any more time, let's bring them on up. I'd like you guys to go through and just give a brief background on some of the stuff that you've been doing, the kind of businesses that you started and been running. Um, and then we'll take it from there. All right, my name is Dan Bliss. I'm the founder of uh, PerfectBusiness.com, which is a website that helps entrepreneurs start businesses. And um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I haven't had a job since I was a, I was a bus boy in 1989. It was the last time I had a job. Um, uh, a lot of my early experience was uh, starting restaurants and bars and um, that sort of thing. I also ran uh, concert clubs, music festivals. I started a publication. I uh, decided I didn't want to be in the, in the bar business anymore, so I moved out to L.A. and started projects out here, and um, which led me to starting Perfect Business. My partner is uh, Mark Burge, the founder of uh, Westside Rentals, and we became very good friends, and we're both just you know serial entrepreneurs, and we decided to start something to help other people start their businesses because people didn't know where to go. So that's cool. it. Sure. And so you, um, Dan's also supporting, I think a lot of you have heard about it, the conference, The Perfect Pitch. He's bringing in Richard Branson. What date is this happening? Uh, October 26th. It's a Monday. It's about uh, this, it's next month. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's going to be a pretty big event. We've got 20 amazing speakers. It's at the Ritz Carlton and Marina Del Rey. Cool. So and this will be one of the premier technology events. I encourage you guys all to go out there. I've bought a slew of tickets that we'll be giving away. You've got Richard Branson. You've got um, from DFJ, Tim Draper. You've got a lot of the top entrepreneurs from LA, including like. A lot of the guys I know you've got from my life, Jeff Tinsley, um, I think it's going to be a pretty cool conference and I'm going to probably buy some more tickets so we can give away to all the people coming to the event here. But it's, they can go to theperfectpitch.com, right? Yeah, it's theperfectpitch.com. You can also go to perfectbusiness.com and you'll find a link to the cool. conference. And in a little bit I'm going to have you tell everyone here how you actually got Richard Branson to participate in the conference, but I think that by itself is a pretty cool story. So, well. Uh, my name is Will Schroeder. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of a new company called AffordIt.com. Uh, what we're doing at Afford is we're taking the price of items for sale, like a, uh, an Xbox or a PlayStation, and selling them for weekly payments. So it's essentially a microfinance play on the web. Uh, my background is I started one of the first web design companies back in 94 called Blue Diesel. Um, grew that to about $65 million, and then we rolled it into an ad agency called Incord. And I joined that and, uh, and helped uh, lead Incord. We grew that to about $600 million and then sold it off and became a public company that's doing over a billion, and I have nothing to do with it at this point. Um, I, uh, while I was doing that, I started another company uh, called Keltech that did content management back in 96, sold it off to a company called GTCR. Uh, after that, I started a web incubator called Virgicon Ventures. Uh, at Virgicon, we stamped out a company called Swapalease.com. It became the largest uh, automotive lease exchange. Uh, we ended up selling that off. Uh, I then started a company called the Go Big Network, uh, connects entrepreneurs to capital. Uh, there's about 200,000 companies that use Go Big now and about 20,000 investors to connect. Uh, I then started another company called GotCast.com. Uh, it's become the largest site for uh, casting for television. Uh, if you, do you do anything besides our companies, by the way? Like uh, no, hobbies no. or? 
nothing like at all. Movies. And he never sleeps. And I never sleep, clearly. Um, and uh, that's, that's what brought me out to LA. All the, the uh, companies I was telling you about were all based in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and so I'm just recently a transplant here uh, with Affordit. Um, and uh, beyond that, I just do a ton of uh, blogging and writing. I uh, just relaunched my blog yesterday. It's at willschroeder.com. Uh, and I'm tweeting at Will Schroeder, so I'm a busy boy. Very nice. I'm Chance Barnett. Uh, most recently, I'm the founder and CEO of Gig.fm. Uh, it's a personalized concert alerts and recommendation platform that also helps artists and venues market and ticket um, their shows. Um, prior to that, I was uh, a partner and then founder at uh, a company, Hot Topic Media. Um, I I'm an expert author and speaker there. Uh, developed a, about a $15 million a year business uh, that helps um, women in relationships. Um, I use my background and experience in psychology um, to, uh, to grow that business, uh, but that was in partnership with my, uh, my business, business partner. There? It's a business oh, now. Sweet. Yeah. I have another business. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it is a business. <laughs> But we did that all through direct, uh, direct marketing online, um, selling ebooks, CDs, and DVDs. So really being of service to people. We've taken that model and applied it to several other niches and uh, areas, bringing on a small handful of other authors, coaching them, showing them our model, and uh, replicating that success. So that's Hot Topic Media. I'm one of the partners there in the business and the founder of Catch Em Inc. That you can see me under my pen name alter ego, Christian Carter. Um, so, and uh, I tweet under the handle at Chance Bar and uh, currently authoring a, a book on entrepreneurship. Cool. So each of these fellows in some way, shape or form are running an e-commerce like business. I think the one thing that we're not talking too much about tonight is maybe a traditional goods business, but um, you're selling digital content that you created, Chance, so you're creating e-books and selling those over the web. You've dealt, and I guess the closest to physical goods in that you were helping people find cars. Mm -hmm. You know, you weren't selling the cars directly, but you were brokering that relationship and had all the e-commerce businesses there. We're selling Xboxes now. Cool, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, so the closest to digital goods. Um, and then with your product. I sold poker DVDs too at one point. I love that. <laughs> all right. So uh, we're going to jump into the e-commerce stuff in a little bit, but really what I want to do is I want to dive a little bit more into each of your background. So, um, these guys are all my friends. I asked them before here, I said, hey, is any question off limits? They said no, so they screw themselves because you guys know I will ask anything. And then in a little bit, we're gonna open it up for all of you to ask. So starting off, once again, stay on this theme of starting businesses that make money off the bat. Did, any, did you guys start with a, a wad of cash yourself? Did any of you guys come from super rich families, trust funds, anything? Like, how, how much money did you guys have when you started your first business? Like, how much did you have in your bank account when you started your first business? I didn't have a nickel. You didn't have a nickel. Well? Uh, I had tens of dollars. Tens of dollars, <laughs> wow. Chance? I had a, a few hundred dollars, and I tried to cram as much learning as I could into uh, a two-week window, and I made it a point to only spend $500 to get the key data that I needed to see if there cool. was an opportunity. All right. So he's the rich one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just to start off with, no one here can claim bias that, well, they, you know, they uh, had all this money to start off with or anything. Like, they didn't have anything except their good lucks to help them out. So, Chance, I want to actually want to start with you because I, I, you and I were talking the other week and I found your business just so interesting. So back up and tell me how you first got into um, creating content and selling it and, and how you got into the this last business of so you, you wrote a book called? My book's called Catch Em and Keep Em. And what's the, what's the point of that ebook? Uh, the point of the ebook is really to have women understand some things that they need in becoming more successful at attracting men and having great relationships. Um, but you know, they come for the stuff that they think they want, but then they stay and they learn the stuff that they actually need, which is, I think, a really important part about marketing and selling products to understand is that oftentimes you need to lead with what people want or think they want and then give them what they really need. So let's go into an example of this. What, what's an example of a headline or something that a woman, you think a woman <laughs> thinks that she needs, <laughs> but then you give her what she wants? You know, the irony is that I, I think I've delivered around 850, email, 850 million emails to opt-in subscribers that are women, but I'm a little shy about doing it in a person. <laughs> um, an example would be um, going to uh, an area of their life and I identifying it in a way that they maybe have never thought of before. If you can identify someone's situation 
more accurately than they can and sum it up in a short, brief manner, they'll actually give you the power of knowing how to solve that situation for them. So it's really profound what you can communicate in a subject line to someone, and a lot of us take that for granted. And other direct marketers who understand this know you can two times, three times, 10 times your response rate just by coming up with a better uh, subject line on an email, for example. All right, so going back to starting up, how did, how did you first get into this business? What did you first create and how did you first start making money, not having a lot of money to start off with? Good question. Well, um, I, I spent eight months writing my book and doing a lot of research, but once I had that, and, and actually way before I even had my book finished and launched it, I, I wanted to build my product, not for myself, but I wanted to build it for my market. And so not being vain and not thinking that I knew everything, I went out and used the best tool in the world, the internet, to do that. And How long ago were you, did you start writing this book? This was in the year 2000. Okay. And um, you know, a lot of us take it for granted, the tool that we have right in front of us every time we sit down on our computer, that we have virtually unlimited startup cost. So it, it costs you nothing to place an ad somewhere. On Google AdWords, you can do a minimum five cent cost per click on some keywords five cents to learn something about your potential customer. So no barrier to entry there, yet almost unlimited potential once you find something that works. So I went right to the most scalable source that I see that I know you can turn on and scale, which is Google AdWords. Okay. It's so you're, you're thinking to yourself in 2000, I'm gonna write a book for women, teaching them how to be successful in relationships. And it takes you how long to do this? Uh, it took me about eight months to write the okay. book. Take eight months to write the book, I'm assuming you actually did research during this time. You got out in the field. You experimented. <laughs> you you're done with this book. Day one, you're done. How, how long did it take for you to, you know, what did that first year look like in terms of what you brought in, in terms of revenue? Uh, the first year, uh, the business launched to uh, some great success. I actually have a, a marketing mentor who uh, is my business partner who writes for men, dating advice for men. And uh, he had had a little bit of a head start with his business. Um, with some of the shortcuts that I learned and the business model working, um, within the first three months, we had around forty-five to 50000 a month in revenue just in, after two and a half months. And was that mostly through email lists? Was it through buying traffic? Was it a combination of both? So our, our model was... You know, if you reverse engineer it, a lot of people mess it up because it looks too simple to work. But if you're willing to create content that's of value, that actually adds value to people's lives, our model is pretty simple. It's um, find a target audience that really matches what you're doing through keywords. Um, send it to a page that you take time to consciously write as a human being to another human being. Real thoughtful things. You know, a lot of us are thinking about how can we stamp out content for SEO and, and, and rank. Um, that's one approach, um, but how can you have something that will wow someone based on what they've been searching for in that moment where they're alone on their computer and no one else is around and they type in this really sensitive term like uh, how do I get my boyfriend back for example that you can learn a lot about someone from what they're telling you but a lot of us aren't paying attention when we're being copywriters or marketers or advertisers. We're taking that for granted and we're trying and to... So you're them. buying hundreds if not thousands of terms like how do I get my boyfriend back you're taking them to one of these classic long landing pages that scrolls down the Our landing pages are, are relatively short to the point telling them what they're actually gonna learn and then we convert them to an email subscriber. So, so your goal is to get someone from the traffic that you're buying into a short page, get them to an email, and then after a series of emails, you get them to buy the book that you wrote. Yeah, so a very small percentage, less than 1% of our traffic or subscribers who get in would buy on the first visit. Mm -hmm. But within 30, 60, 90 days, we would monetize that. But again, that takes real dedication and offering value via email. So those follow-up emails that we have are, are now automated because I've written those for years. Um, around the products and, and helping women in their lives. And you were telling me early, earlier how many of these books, have, how many of this one book have you sold in the last uh, eight years? You know, at last count, I've probably sold, you know, somewhere shy of a million at, at about twenty nine ninety seven a book. Okay, pretty good business. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, well, let's see if you can talk that. Booyah! <laughs> All right. I want to so, be that business. Are you kidding me? It's just brilliant. So, it's field research. Um, <laughs> The write-offs are incredible. No, it's like, man, I wish I thought of that first. This from the guy that runs a business called Gotcast, where yeah. he's literally the judge for like models <laughs> that want to get on. And I told you, I was thinking this. Yeah. So, this uh, tell me, tell me about that first business. I remember when the first time we were hanging out, and you were talking about being in college and just 
so aggro. I mean, that was a service-based business where you didn't put a lot of money into it up front. Yeah. How did you get that off the ground, and how did, how, well, what do you think were the keys to your success in building up that first business of yours? I mean, the, the businesses that you read about are typically ones that get funded. You know, usually by the time they get funded, they've already had some level of success, and then you hear about them getting accelerated to a sale or an IPO. So because that's what you read most frequently in the press, you just assume that, that capital is where it all starts, which is completely wrong. Most entrepreneurs, and to put it in perspective, there's over 500,000 businesses that get started every month in the U.S. Most entrepreneurs don't raise capital. VCs do about 3,000 deals a year. So most people are going it on their own. Uh, that's what we did at yeah, Blue Diesel. Um, and at Blue Diesel, circa 1994, uh, I decided that I want to start a company that, that builds websites. In 94, there were no companies that did that. I mean, you, somebody's probably going to say, well, I did it in 93 with a CD-ROM. I don't care. It, you weren't building websites in 1994 prior to um, and so all I did was this. Number one, I didn't have a car, okay, because I was a 19-year-old kid in college. Um, I'm in the middle of nowhere. It's called Columbus, Ohio. Um, I don't know a single person. I grew up dead broke. Um, and all I had to do was just hop on the phone and call people. By the way, you couldn't use email, LinkedIn, et cetera, because it didn't exist. So I went down the list of all the Fortune 500 companies actually out of Fortune magazine and cold called every single one of them and said, let me speak to the internet person. Uh, and, and I, but it sounds goofy, but in, in, in 1994, there was only one person that was the internet person, right? So, so when I called Intel, I got the internet person. And when I called MasterCard, I got Jennifer Lavelli, the internet person, right? And Jennifer's, hi, I'm Jennifer Lavelli. I could spell internet, ergo, I'm the internet person, right? Like in every case, in every case, it was the first person, so you had no idea. And mind you, so you know, we talked to MasterCard and they say, hey, we want to do a deal with you. Awesome. Um, can you come to did see you us? Have any, did you actually know how to build a website? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> but neither did anybody else, right? So, I mean, I was in the same, same position, but I knew I could figure it out, right? <laughs> so this is a really important, we, we've talked a lot about this in the past, the idea of pre-selling, selling something, a product you don't have, a service that you may not know how to do, getting the demand, and then after you get the demand, figuring out the supply. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's a commonality across all the businesses that I've done, is that I know exactly zero about all of them going into them. Now, I mean, like, like you know, all, all kidding aside, that that is the one thing. Every time I get into a pitch, whether it's with investors, partners, clients, the first question every time is, "Who the hell are you, and why are you trying to sell me this product?" I had never leased a car before. Uh, I had never cast anybody in television before. I live in Columbus, Ohio, starting a company that casts for television. Right? Like you couldn't be more out of out of the loop. The the point here is, in every case, it's not necessarily about being in some advantageous spot when you start. It's just about understanding exactly what people in the market are looking for and giving them the shortest path to get there, right? We, all of our businesses revolve around one really simple pain point that we just nailed. And you talked about that, you know, looking at what people are searching for and just responding with exactly what they're asking for. With swap lease, we don't sit around and explain um, the complications of a lease transfer. We're like, dude, you're stuck in a lease. We get you out of a lease. Pay here. It's that simple, right? And people do it. And every one of our businesses, Blue Diesel, the same, we understood what the pain was. In 1994, um, Mosaic was out, Netscape was just starting to, to get its feet, uh, Mark Andreessen was gonna be on the cover of Time Magazine. Like, everyone was talking about the internet and no one had any idea how to respond to that question, what do we do about the internet? So I just called people and said, guess what, we have the answer. Build a website, we'll build it for you. And so how did you, I mean, what did you do? Did you find a group of developers and programmers and you started building these websites and you were managing this all as a 19-year-old kid in college? Yeah, so what I did is I went around my dorm and I got uh, all of my, this is actually, this is an entirely true story. The, the first client that we ever got was a company called uh, AAA uh, in, in one of their, their groups that was based out of Columbus. And I remember, I remember specifically the way we got this client, it was uh, my roommate was dating this girl who um, her father went to church with a guy who was the marketing director of AAA. And that, that's how we got the, the first intro. And, um, and so I'd gone out there to meet with him. He liked me. I, like, I'm 35 years old, and I look like a child. You can imagine what I look like when I was 19. I look like I was four years old, right? I look like some, somebody had lost their kid. I take your kid to work there. And so, so I show up, give him my pitch, and he's like, sure, internet guy. He's like, but I need to come see your offices. I'm like, shit, we don't have an office, right? But I said, by all means, come by on Friday. It's going to be awesome. I'll send you the address. So mind you, it's Monday. We have no office whatsoever. And this guy's going to come and check it out. It's our first client. Look, it didn't occur to us to get an office because we didn't have any clients, right? And we weren't that bright. And so what I did was I shopped around campus. Now, mind you, uh, Ohio State's a big campus. But on any campus, 
there aren't really office spaces on campus and I still don't have a car. So I need to find a place that's within walking distance. We ended up finding this place above a concert hall that was like a loft. Uh, I ended up negotiating the lease with the owner the next day. Um, we had exactly enough money that we'd borrowed from my friend's parents uh, to put down in the lease. There's no way we we're gonna be able to make a second payment. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so we needed to furnish this whole thing. And so I said, we've got this guy coming on Friday. We've gotta have furnish, uh, furniture. We need to have the entire place decked out by the time he shows up on Friday. So what do we do? Um, Ohio State has this place called Surplus. It's where all the crap in Ohio State goes to die. Like if there's desks and, and tables and whatever, it goes to Surplus. Um, so I borrow my buddy's pickup truck and we drive over there. And it's me and a bunch of my friends from the dorm that are kind of my employees. And I sit down uh, with these guys and say, listen, I want the, that pile of fax machines, I want that pile of phones, I want that pile of computers, desks, etc." And there's some uh, kid doing his work study He's like, what? none of this stuff works. I'm like, dude, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I, I'm, I still have this check. I remember it was the first check we ever wrote because we were going to write the, the, the rent check once we moved in. We wrote a check for $37. And I had this like, magical number. Like, I was so happy that this kid would take $37 for what was essentially junk. And I handed it to him. And he was so happy to get rid of all this stuff. I don't know why. And we loaded into my, my buddy's truck. We drive back. We look like Sanford and Son with all of our crap in the back. And uh, we get there, and we set everything up. Friday comes, client shows up, he walks through the door. I had all of my friends, about 20 of my friends from the dorms, all put on like the one uh, shirt and tie that they had, <laughs> and walk around, this is, like, this is Hollywood, so it makes sense here, right? It was literally, I, no, no exaggeration, it was a Hollywood movie set. And all these guys were walking around, uh, it looked busy as can be. I pretty much told them to look busy, right? And they're running around, and I'm showing them like through the offices, like, oh, there's Bob, hey, Bob, how's it going, right? You know, we're going through the whole thing. And we'd be sitting there, and I'd be explaining kind of what we're going to do on the one computer that actually works, which is my laptop. Um, and it, like, Bob would come over, he's like, Will, what do you think of this? And it'd be like his book report. I'm like, run with it, you know? And, like, it, and so, but, but, you know, sorry for a long-winded story, but the, the, the point here is, like, you have to improvise. Like, what I'm saying is, is, is kind of, it sounds goofy. In retrospect, it just made sense. We were like, ha, 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 this is going to be funny that we're so broke. We're like, this sucks, and this is what we have to do. But like we were willing to do whatever it took to make things go. Now we also weren't selling snake oil. Like what we were presenting to him was going to get done. They became a big client for us. We did a phenomenal amount of work. So and in that first year, how many clients did you work with? Um, maybe a dozen, and we did really small engagements. Um, and, and again, what about the second year? Uh, well, then it started to accelerate a bit because that was only a, a, about a year and a half. Yeah, once we got a year and a half, we got a couple clients like uh, Bank One, which is now Chase, uh, that became really big clients. For and us. how many years until you sold the business? Uh, three. And then at, at when you sold the business, how much did you sell it for? A lot. Can you say the specific amount? Okay. Um, and then you immediately went over and started the other businesses. Yeah, well, so, so in, in 90, so I sold uh, technically half the business in 97, then I joined the, the board of the then small agency, and we won about $250 million for the billings about three months later, which helps. And uh, while I was doing that, I started a software company, so I was running them both. One was in Columbus, one was in Cleveland, which is about two hours away. And so it's just working seven days a week. Cool. So the next question I have for you when we come back is, I think one of the things that Will does best and that I've learned a lot from is, um, we hear a lot about in businesses where you raise money and getting to scale and figuring out how to monetize. And the question is, do you do something freemium where you give people stuff for free and then make money in the advertising? And, or who do you charge and how do you do it? One of the things that Will has just been great at is, he charges everybody. If there's a seller, the seller has a fee for a listing, the buyer's got to pay, and then they've got to pay double extra when the fee goes through. I mean, you just charge every which way combination <laughs> possible. And from day one, even if those websites aren't doing a lot of traffic, they're bringing in money from that you know, very first week, right? Is the camera on? Can I respond to that? Um, we, uh, what we do is we recognize that we have no idea uh, what our customers are thinking when we enter markets. So whether it's swap lease, go big, got cast, now afford it. And we test every price combination possible. And we really learned this in at swap lease kind of circa 2002, 2003. It's kind of the dawn of performance marketing with CPC, CPA, where you're spending a fixed amount to send somebody to a page and the conversion of that page was your business, right? Your product behind it didn't matter if, if people couldn't make it past that page. Initially, we thought people would buy ads on swap lease to list their car for $19, a one-time fee. And we'd be so happy if they paid that. Uh, nowadays, if you go to Swapolis, 
you pay anywhere between $100 to $150 for the exact same ad. We tried every possible, possible price point from $20 to probably, God, north of $800 on our landing pages. Uh, because there's one thing you cannot afford to guess at, and that's pricing. You have to give yourself an opportunity to try every possible price, because even a, a marginal increase in, your, in what you're charging fundamentally changes every aspect of your business. Not just your net margin, but how much cash you can bring in to then reinvest into the business. The, the biggest mistake I see people making is guessing at their pricing and not testing their pricing. Just It's not really an option. Yeah, one of the counterintuitive things, you might have learned this, is um, you, know, you can actually raise your price and then people are converting more as, on a percentage basis than a lower price. And perceived value has all kinds of weird things attached to it for us as people. Um, so a great example of that is what you're talking about. And, and then those things can also affect the back end of your business. Do people come back and buy again based on that perceived value? We, we have the same pricing strategy that we use every time. We have the, um, it's so low that if you were going to use this service at all, you'd at least pay this price. The, it's so high that you're an idiot if you pay this price, but it makes the other price seem small. And the package in the middle, which incidentally is what, what anybody pick, or what everybody picks no matter what you charge. Um, it sounds bizarre, but I've done it across five different businesses, and the answer is the same every single time in totally different industries. So it's, it's not incidental at this point. I mean, people come here and give you kind of like, hey, here's a, a study that was done. This isn't a study. This is actually how we run our businesses, and this is actually what works. Um, your mileage may vary, but I'm just saying it's incredibly consistent across all the businesses. Um, and you can change those price points and those thresholds. So maybe you think that people should be paying $20 uh, for your product. Cool. But there should also be a price point that's $200, and you make up whatever that package might be. Maybe they get a date with you. Um, uh, maybe it's much higher than $200, sorry. Thanks, Will. Yeah, price you out of the market. <laughs> and then there's the middle point, which is kind of higher than, than what, what option one would be, um, but not nearly as bad as, as option three. Um, and that's really where the core of your product lies. And if you look at enough pricing models right now, kind of your typical three-bar graphs, usually one includes free, um, that's ultimately what you're seeing time and time again, and there's a reason for that because because it works. Well, we, we did a lot of testing too with uh, with Perfect Business, and we we started as a monthly subscription, and we realized that people didn't want to commit to that as a monthly thing for transactions. And what like can you explain just for a second what Perfect Business is offering for those folks that haven't seen the website? All right. Well, when 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 we started Perfect Business, we we had you know. Um, we had some thoughts about getting into the uh, uh, social networking landscape. Obviously, Web 2.0 was really hot when we first conceived it, and um, and so we started. At, you know, we started as a freemium model. We started as a freemium subscription model, and um, as we were doing it, we tested different price points, of course, and um, even different price levels. We had gold, silver, and basic, and and different things like that. And then we realized that. I think, and I, th I think a lot of you can relate to this, you sign up for a website and a subscription, you're like, oh, that's gonna hurt, because I'm gonna sign up, I'm gonna forget about it, and, and then down the road I realize, oh my God, look how much I paid, you know? And it costs you a lot more. And we realized that after talking to a lot of our members, because again, you have to understand, you have to talk to people, you have to ask them, you have to you know, find somebody that's done something on your site and ask them why they did it or why they didn't do it, and what they're looking for. And what we realized is that we offer a, a, a variety of services to entrepreneurs, but everyone has different needs. And we were like kind of just bundling them all and saying, hey, it's, it's X dollars a month. And what we realized pretty quickly was that, well, actually not pretty quickly, it took us a while, but um, just through trial and error and talking to our, to our people, and we even did some focus groups, we did a lot of different things to, to actually understand our customer, and we realized they all have different needs. So we decided, well, well, we'll screw the monthly subscription. Let's go a la carte, and let's offer different things a la carte. So we created a business plan software on our site, and we're bundling that with other premium services to help them find funding, and we have uh, business courses, and we charge premiums for those things. Well, somebody might want a course on, on PR, let's say, but they're not interested in getting funding, and maybe they're not interested in writing a business plan. They want, they want help with PR, so you know, they might buy that a la carte. So, so just through trial and errors, we've, we've figured out you know, the, the proper structure, and, and we're still testing, we're always testing. There's three words you can remember about your business. Write it, tape it to your eyeballs, it's test and measure. So apply this to everything you're doing. So conversion on a landing page. I knew it wouldn't be good the first time, so I looked at other people's landing pages to convert to email, 
and I took what I knew worked and who had high converting landing pages. What were some of those elements? What were the elements of um, There's key elements. Everyone wants to design a landing page that looks fancy, that wows your customers, that has a great logo. Save yourself the time and money and expense and get language out there to learn what your customers respond to. So the first place you can do that is actually in whatever ad you have. That's actually framing where people are gonna land for them, so that matters. A lot of times we talked about that the ugliest conversion, the ugliest landing page is converted the best. If you, I guarantee you, if we sat down and I put my computer and I pulled up my site, my marketing for you right now, you'd go, oh dude, I know a really good web designer, let me, uh, let me give you the card. <laughs> and everyone does that, and, and it's funny now because I wait to hear it, um, but our landing pages, and for our company, you know, we've replicated this model in a lot of ways, it looks like some 19-year-old kid took it and wrote a headline, it has no fancy design, the point is that it has no distractions and there's only one decision to make and that's either you're giving us your email address or you're not. So we lose on average 70% of the people who come to our site, but guess what? We get 30% of them to stay around and we get to remarket to them ad infinitum. So you don't have pretty flowery pages, you don't have nav bars, you don't have links to lots of other pieces of content, you don't give people multiple choices, there's this one thing that they get to do and all the language and everything on that page is geared to gain them to do that one thing. Yeah, so I'll run through the basic elements um, and if you've studied copywriting or advertising you'll know these things. The most important piece on your page is whatever dominant visual element is on that page and for us it's always a headline because we're very much language and self-help oriented. So um, our headline dominates our page. You're not gonna look anywhere else if you go to our page. First. What are examples of some of your headlines that are meant to catch people right away? You're about to learn something that could make you a million dollars in advertising next year in your business. That would be my headline for this crowd. You're about to learn how to start a business without raising hundreds of thousands of dollars and keep all the equity in your company. Okay, now you really got me thinking. Okay, what does this person know? So that's my headline and that's the dominant visual element. Now you have me framed for something that is for me. Um, the rest of the page is really simple. You wanna demonstrate value. So the language or the names that you use for your ideas or the concepts that you're talking about really communicates something subtly about who you are and if you are really a value for someone. So if someone's coming to DocStock, the language on your site should say that it's not just some company that's throwing up documents and thinks they're cool. You should demonstrate some expertise and that there's people who know what they're doing talking about the documents that are there or referencing that there's experts. So not only it's like having a document mascot yeah. <laughs> dancing around, like because you'd be a, you'd have to be a badass to have your own like mascot that's a document. Uh, I don't know about that, okay. but sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that's one element: de that, demonstrating yeah. expertise, and you can do this in subtle ways by things like naming or how you phrase or frame things. Um, so the other elements that are really important on a landing page are, and people I can't believe that people get away from it: a call to action. So one of the things that most people make the mistake of is not giving people very explicit, simple, one-step instructions online. I'll say it again, one step at a time, single instruction, do this here now. I, it, it's the, the biggest mistake that I see people make is- we're, we're a big fan of big red buttons. There you go. And it says sign up free here. And or, so as far as selling your book, do you deliver the book as an automatic download or as an email that it comes to them or both? Uh, our book is a uh, download once you buy and it comes to them, uh, but we've tested a lot of different offers. We've tested a portion of it as uh, a PDF giveaway, so more of a freemium type thing. We've tested videos on the front end. And is someone just putting in their credit card right then and buying it and they say submit and then the, do the document starts downloading, the book well, starts downloading? Our model is if they come to a landing page, we'll convert them to email, then we have- So yeah, let's, let's walk from this beginning to end because I'm assuming there's some other folks here that are part of e-commerce or digital products. Mm -hmm. So um, from the beginning part of buying the traffic in to getting somebody an email page, can you just walk through each of those steps pretty quickly, ending with the commerce and the receipt of the actual purchase of the digital good? So how far do you want me to start? The person online searching all the way to yeah, sale? Yeah, the person online searching all the way to the point of sale. Okay, so that's exactly the formula you need to think through. Who is the person sitting home alone who is searching for something and what are they really looking for? And that will lead you to the right places to start to identify your market, who is that, and that should influence your landing page. So we were just talking about the landing page. Um, do yourself a favor though, as you're developing your landing page language, use things like Google AdWords to test ads, even if you're not capturing 
conversions are selling to test headlines there. Um, uh, Tim Ferriss in, uh, I don't know why I wanted to say that you're Tim Ferriss right now, you kind of look like him. Um, in the yeah, four-day work week. egg-shaped head, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, great. Can you it? No, because you're smart. Um, he talks about this, that he had a couple different names for his book. And instead of thinking he knew the na right name for the book, he actually went to Google AdWords, turned on an account, and tested and spent $300 seeing what got the highest click-through rate. And he found that four-hour four work week worked the best. And so that was the name of the book. So do that for yourself. Do that because your customers will tell you. So what are some of the other keywords that you're buying besides what do I do now with my boy? What was the keyword that you threw out there? How to get my boyfriend back. How to get my boyfriend back. What are some other ones that you're buying? Uh, well, we probably bid on 100 to 250,000 keywords depending on how much we want to spend, what if level of efficiency we want in our company, and then we look at our company in terms of vintages of leads. So if we're bidding a lot for less qualified terms, people that might not be exactly urgent or in a tough situation in their relationship, um, we're going to get some conversion from that. But there's not going to be, many, be as many buyers coming over the next 30 days from that group of people because they were less qualified. So you're buying a whole group of keywords where there's some sense of urgency and a pain point around it. You get somebody into a landing page, the whole purpose of that page is just to get their email. So you're saying there's nothing going on that page except you, you, know, you know you're going to lose 70% of them but capture 30% of those emails. On average. Then, you're gonna, then you know that you're going to send them an email and within the first 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days, there's a what percent chance that that group's then going to go through and actually buy the book? Uh, we're going to follow up with them. Uh, we've tested three times a week or two times a week. Um, we've stuck with three times a week just because we like... So you'll send them three or, emails in a week? Three emails in a week, but... Remember, what percentage of those people unsubscribe? Uh, yeah, in the first week, there's about an 8% subscribe rate, but I see that as a funneling process to identify Absolutely. the people who are the real leads, and then you also don't have email spam problems. So you can send somebody for a month, three emails a week, you prefer three months straight, three emails a week, and you're, you're going to only lose, what, 10, 15% 15, 15 of those folks? Yeah, and the most common success story I get, I get literally hundreds a week from women emailing me saying, uh, you know, I signed up, I was like, what is the site? I don't know if I trust it, I don't know who you are, but then I read and on my first visit it didn't seem like for me. But then I started getting your emails. Or someone just gets signed up or their friends sign them up and I think and they say, for some reason I'm getting your emails and they bug me. But then I started reading them. Wow, and you know, it's 30 days later and I bought your book and I'm really glad that I did. And let me share the story of what's happening in my relationship. So what percentage of the folks that get your emails actually buy your book? Uh, over first 30 days, it's kind of sensitive marketing information, but uh, I would say over a 30 day period, we're looking at one to two percent around there for, for the, the paid search channel. And then there, the final step is that they're going to a page, they, can you describe that final page where they buy the book and how that works? Sure, so uh, once someone converts on our email conversion landing page, they're taken to that long form sales letter. And if you look at that and it's not for you or you're not in that place in your life where you went online and typed into Google, how do I get my boyfriend back? Then that sales page isn't for you. So when you look at it as a business owner or a marketer, um, or, or as someone who's not involved in that, you would never read it. But when you're that person, you want to know all the things that are going on there. You want someone to walk you through why this is important, to, to show you proof, to address the objections that you might have to actually buying this in the first place. So the sales letter accomplishes all of those things, and I really have a formula for those things. I have 10 other products too that are CDs and DVDs. Um, but in short, again, it's the same formula. Have a, a headline that grabs their attention, frames what this is really for and what it's about, and then gives proof, and then actually gives away a lot of value. And then just as a final book. step, do, do you offer a, a refund policy, return policy on the book? 100% refund, actually, any time. So if any woman ever emailed And it's what like, percent of those folks have actually ever returned the book? Um, well, it depends on what offer they buy with. So this is a really fascinating study we looked at uh, on our database, and uh, we have multiple offers that we've tested. One of the offers for the longest time was a 30-day free trial, and then another offer was a seven-day free trial, and then another offer is pay full now. Uh, the pay full now actually have the lowest return rate, which is almost counterintuitive. Uh, the 30-day have a higher return rate than the seven-day. So these are things that are surprising and that you would only learn. But when we moved from when a you paid say return rate, what do you mean? I'm not sure. Return rate. We have a 100% return policy. So if, if, oh. you, if you say, I don't want to keep the book, we'll give you all your money back. No questions asked. Okay. So that's always been our policy. 
Um, and, and I like doing business that way. If I, if I don't deliver the value that I said I would deliver and that you were expecting. But is it any time, do you feel like people are ripping you off? Is it any kind of significant percentage of folks that are returning yeah, the book? Yeah, there's, there's certainly that. Um, so we do, and in, in that market, what I am, I, you would call an information publisher or an information marketer, like the industry standard return rates are anywhere from, from 15 to 25%, and we're on the high end of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Just as a point of comparison, Duty, are you here? Yeah. How, what, it's, what percent of documents we've sold on DocSoc so far have gotten returned? Um, I think like 5%, 5 to 6%. 5 to 6% have got returned? Cool. Yeah, I mean, we, we put in a 100% money back guarantee. I think we set it for 14 days you can do it within. 14 days, and it's a very low percentage. We, we worry that people are just gonna return Say hey, we don't want this document. It's it's pretty low actually. Mm. So Will, you talk. And so thank you by the way for sharing all the information. Uh, Will, we talk about some of the e-commerce businesses that you started and the differences between them and maybe some that were more in physical goods like you're doing now uh, versus a digital you know offer or service and what you found to be some of the main keys to success in your e-commerce businesses. The other thing I think that would be really helpful is um, you had an incubator where you were building companies and. How did you actually build e-commerce? Did you use outside third-party platforms and plug them in, or did you always build a custom solution from the ground up, and how hard and expensive was that to do? All right, um, so as, as far as cost, we built everything from the ground up. We do every single aspect of our business from, um, from the SEO to the PR to the development. Everything is done in-house by a relatively small team of people, about 20 people. Um, and the reason for that is because in our case, we've had the same like How many developers? Um, five. Okay. Yeah. Um, the reason for that is because a lot of people tend to think of um, a 1999 website, which used to take reams and reams of developers. I know at Blue Diesel, we had hundreds of them, and, and uh, we built huge installations. Anymore, you need one good developer to build mostly anything <coughs> that you want to do. And most sites get developed in just that way. It's one developer kind of getting through a prototype. What gets overlooked, uh, and this, this, this really irks me, it took me a long time to figure this out, is chances are if you're the first 12 months into your business, you're probably building the wrong product. I mean, just, and I can almost guarantee you are. I know that we do every single time. I mean, we actually bake it into our, our analysis. The reason for that is because you have no idea exactly what product to build right now uh, until you actually get it out there. And so people tend to think about it like this. They say, let me spend a lot of time and a lot of cycles in order to build this big, kick-ass product that everyone's going to love, and let me throw it out there, and everyone's just going to rave about it, and it's going to be awesome, and we're going to nail the, the market, and we're going to nail the product set and everything. You're going to fail. That is a horrible way to launch your product, right? Um, the reason for that is because you don't know anything yet. You actually have to give the, the customers an opportunity to tell you what they're looking to buy. Examples. Uh, at Go Big, uh, our initial idea in circa 2004 was to build a platform so entrepreneurs could connect to each other. It was LinkedIn for entrepreneurs. Great idea, right? Wrong. Um, it was a stupid idea. But until we built it and got it out there, um, we didn't know that. So what we did is we built enough to get it out there. We built this cool linking system you could share how, with friends. How long from idea or starting to work on it to getting it live did it take you? Probably six months. Okay. Um, and would you consider that the long end of what you'd want or the medium or the short end? Yeah, to, to put it in perspective, Swap Lease took nine months, Go Big took six months, Godcast took three months. Afford it took six weeks. If we build enough, we could be able to get them done in an hour. <laughs> um, but no, actually, those, those are all in, entirely accurate dev cycles. And the reason is because with our team, once you've built a subscription engine, you've built it. Once you've built user account management, once you've built reporting, once you've built whatever, at this point, it's off the shelf stuff. And more importantly, it's off the shelf stuff that actually works, um, that we've tuned to, to work exactly the way it should work. Um, but, but going back to, to go big for a minute, until we got the product out there, until we got some customers to see what was going on, we didn't actually know what product we were supposed to build. Turns out we were supposed to build a classified advertising business so people could post ads to say, I'm looking for funding, talent, etc. We found that out because when we launched the site, all the entrepreneurs started messing each other and saying, hey, yeah, great, uh, I know you, you're another entrepreneur. Do you know a developer? Do you know uh, uh, an investor, etc.? They told us they wanted an entirely different product. And so Go Big evolved to be an entirely different product. Uh, Gotcast was more or less the same thing when we launched Gotcast. We thought it would be a fun voting site where people would, would vote for stuff like uh, they did on Bix and other content sites. What we found is 
the voting was neat and people kind of liked it, but people actually wanted to get on television. So we had to focus a lot more of our time in recasting it and focusing on actually getting lots of people on TV. Um, so with that said, we're talking about dev cycles, the amount of time you spend on things. Really, what we focus on now is build just enough to get a product that's visible, but more importantly, build your product so that people can see kind of where everything should be. Example, uh, we just launched a company called bizplan.com. It's to do business planning online, right? Essentially, business planning online is a pretty straightforward product. You're gonna have a business plan builder, you're gonna have some sort of sharing component, and you're gonna have some sort of ability to, to get the plan funded. Um, we could spend two years in dev cycles building the most unbelievable uh, application, and you probably wouldn't use all of it. You'd probably use a few sections of it at most. So we built a little bit of each of those sections, but we built kick-ass landing pages that show everything you know, that that's capable of doing. Um, you're probably not going to buy the product. It's probably too expensive. We don't care. Um, what we're interested in right now is all of our landing pages, which point to the different aspects of the business, we want to see, like we were talking about, what are you clicking on? What are you trying to get more info on? Guess what? That's going to drive what our dev cycles go toward, right? We're, we're letting the marketing and the site traffic, kind of where people's interests lie, drive the product development, which is why we have such tight cycles. So let me, let me ask you about Swap at least, because I, I want you to talk about your first physical goods, e-commerce business in a bit. But Swap at least is really interesting to me because it's e-commerce where it's just brokering a relationship, right? You're actually not delivering the good. You're not, most certainly not getting someone a car. There's someone who has a lease and they want to get out of it. And so potentially someone can buy that lease at a discount mm -hmm. and you get economies of scale. So lots of people doing this, you connect the two, but you were charging the person that wanted to sell the car mm -hmm. and you were charging the person that was the sell the lease and charge the person want to take over the lease. Can you explain that process and kind of how you set up the e-commerce for that business and your thought process and charging both sides and some of the mechanics mm -hmm. of how you set up the e-commerce of that business? Yeah, and, and I'll preface that by saying in all of our businesses, we consider the same ways to charge people. It, it, and we apply all of them. I remember you and I sat down and talked about DocStop. Is it a subscription business? Is it a classified ad business? Is it a, is it a lead gen business? Is it an advertising business or, or some X factor? We try to apply every one of those models to our businesses, and in many cases, they all fit. In some cases, one doesn't, but it would be goofy not to try all of them, right? Um, and so at Swapolis, kind of walking through the, the, the same model. Notice I didn't mention advertising anywhere in there. Um, you know, advertising in our models is known as beer money, right? It's an insignificant, irrelevant part of our model um, because we, we focus more on transactions and a lot less on um, uh, volume. So uh, d even before we get that, what, what are some of the keys? This is a big deal. We spent a lot of time in these sessions talking about building advertising business. The last panel was on it two of them ago, and a lot of the raising money panel, people are defaulting advertising. What are the keys to building an online business where it's transaction-based from the beginning? I, I think Chance nailed it. You have to understand the conversion off a landing page better than anything else. Let, let's just put this in perspective. Let's imagine for a second that Swapolice, the site actually didn't exist, that all that was actually there was our Google ad, which we can go on and create in two seconds, a landing page, and a sign-up page. And there was nothing on the other side of the rest of that sign-up page, okay? You would look at that, you'd look at the offer, hey, that's cool, and you'd probably sign up. Um, now we build a $100 million, most unbelievable Google technology, Mike Arrington loves it, back-end platform, you're still gonna buy at the same rate. You see what I'm saying? Until you get past the, the, the paywall, you don't get a chance to see what's on the other side of the curtain anyway. So why am I spending all these cycles on the other side of the curtain until I understand how people are getting through the paywall and what the messaging is going to want to be, which backtracks to what the product actually is? Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, one of the things I did while I was writing my book is uh, I was doing testing on landing pages to learn and sending them to landing pages. And then I was getting conversion into an email list and instead of sitting around and waiting for my book to be done and then marketing it I wrote and shared the book as I was writing it to that email list and by the time I had finished the book in eight months I had a list of 40,000 subscribers who were instant uh, market and my book was profitable day one. So yeah, one of the things that you're... Back to one of the first things we talked about yeah. that, that you know get the customer get the customer and figure out what what they are and how are you going to get the customer and once you figure that out then you can figure kind of like your, your, you know, some of the things you did. So before you ever had a product, you were actually testing the conversion of the product that was going to come. I, I, I'm overstating it to prove the point. There was obviously a product on the other side of the paywall. I mean, we're not total charlatans, but I'm just saying that like, um, total, total, <laughs> I emphasize total. 
Um, no, but uh, the product's never going to be what you want it to be. Like, you get these guys that are perfectionists, like, oh, I don't want to release until it's the most unbelievable product ever. Well, great, but first off, you're probably going to build the wrong unbelievable product. And second off, once you do, we still have no idea whether anybody's going to buy it. Um, so you need to build enough that the product's viable, um, which is usually a much tighter uh, feature set than most people give credit for. And, and a point there is most sites, uh, all their value comes from doing one thing right. Swap can have 6,000 features, but all you care about is connecting a buyer and a seller, which is essentially a search process. So, right? so talk about this, because I, I just briefly, and then I want to go on to Dan Lynn and uh, talk about the physical goods business he was doing. Uh, your most recent company, Afford It, is really fascinating, because what you're doing there with e-commerce the is you're actually selling products to people that don't have, um, that aren't bankable and may not have credit, and you're actually not even taking a credit card from them, right? right. You're going directly into their bank account. So can you briefly explain what the business is doing and then what you're trying to do with the e-commerce there where you're not even getting a credit card for somebody and you are shipping them a physical good? Yeah, so okay, so the, the premise behind Afford is simply that we're trying to make stuff um, affordable for people and kind of easy payments that they can actually make. So a guy comes on, he wants to buy a PlayStation. Uh, it's, let's say it's, it's $300. Uh, let's say it's three fifty. Actually, um, he comes on. He puts a hundred dollars down uh, with his uh, ATM card, so his debit card and or his uh, check. So it's going to do an HGH transaction. So that's how he makes his his initial deposit. He then has to make uh, the remaining payments over a six month period of time. None of our payments go beyond six months. The whole premise behind Afford It is getting people to pay their stuff off. So there's no way to carry a balance with us. Our business is focused on the outcomes. Um, from there, they'll make a small weekly payment, call it $15 a week, for the next six months. $15 shows up, it dings their bank account automatically like a gym membership um, every seven days. And at the, at the end of that period, they're done. There's, again, there's no revolving line. They can't draw down and again, they're not stuck with minimum monthly payments. Just a really simple mechanism to actually afford and pay stuff off. Great, and so you're actually directly going in their bank account? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's no different than any kind of recurring transaction that you have now on, on a subscription product. So it's kind of like rent a center, but instead of for furniture, goods for your house, for products like a, a video game console that you yeah, want. Yeah. Cool. So Dan, can you talk a little about your initial experience with e-commerce and what you found to be some of the key success in that first business and then how you translated that into perfect business? Well, um, my, uh, my first experience in that was basically stuff back behind the scenes of like concert venues and things like that. So we sold a lot of tickets and stuff online. Um, when we weren't selling them through Ticketmaster, we were selling them directly ourselves. So we learned a lot about customer interface and, and dealing with uh, you know, value proposition to people and uh, convincing them to buy something. Um, but uh, I, I just threw this out, you didn't really know this about me, but I, I, I produced a DVD on how to play poker. And we did this very affordably with something we threw together and it turned into a direct response campaign. And, we, and this is back when, uh, when poker was really hot, 2002 or so, 2003. And um, we produced this poker DVD on how to play poker and we had a good hook. We had, a, we had a, it was a World Series of Poker Champ along with uh, the cast of The Sopranos. So it was wise guys on DVD, uh, wise guys on poker. And, uh, How'd you get the cast of The Sopranos to agree to this? Uh, wish we had got cast. We would have, we would have <laughs> used that, but uh, just uh, you know, just being an entrepreneur, you know, be, uh, got a partner on board that was a casting. Did you build your own fake office for them to come to? <laughs> no, we didn't, we didn't. We didn't have to do it for that project. Okay. But uh, but but in, in terms of the e-commerce related stuff, just to let everybody know, I mean, you you guys are here because you're entrepreneurs, and when when you do something, you don't necessarily need the money that you think you need to get something off the ground. And um, we did a direct response campaign. If you guys see all those infomercials on TV, you think, oh my God, that costs a ridiculous amount of money. But I don't know if you guys know this, there's a company out there called Media Funding. And there's other companies out there like them. And what they do is you can, um, if you can raise enough money, five grand, 10 grand, to do a trial. So if, you, you know, if you're good um, video production people and you can make a commercial, make an infomercial for whatever your product is, you call Media Funding, and they will, uh, they will fund a media campaign if all you do is prove it. So for example, if you run a campaign, you spend 10 grand, and they'll have to monitor it because they want to make sure you're not cheating, okay? And you have a call center taking all your incoming calls for your orders, and if you generate, say, a 1.7 to 1 ratio of what you spent on the campaign, so if you do a $10,000 trial, 
If you bring in $17,000 in orders, minimum, hopefully you'll bring in $20,000 or more, they'll say, you know what, I'll fund whatever media campaign you want. We'll give you hundreds of thousands of dollars and they'll take a cut. So as a result, you could you, you, you can have a $10,000 trial, which is a pretty low entry point, and if you've got a camera and an editing, editing equipment, you can produce a video, let's say it's that, and then you build a website, and then you do a lot of trials and experiments with your pricing on the website, you do the exact same experimenting on a direct response campaign, but there, there's ways to get you know, an entrepreneur project off the ground with, without a huge, huge budget. You can have a half a million dollar media campaign or something like that. And of course, that all promotes your website as well, so you're bringing transaction, transactions on your, on your website in addition to um, into your call center. Yeah, it, what you said brings up a great point. I forget who said it to me uh, four or five years ago, but um, and this might bum out some angels or VCs in the room, um, but the rare thing in the world is not money. The rare thing in the world is a great idea that can be executed and it takes one dollar and turns it into a dollar fifty or a dollar seventy or two bucks. Um, if you can stop focusing on everything else, forget about getting a great business card, and focus on those numbers and stop you know, fudging those a little bit or hoping that advertising will just make it up and then you can maybe get to the next round and sit and sweat on what that is and how you're gonna take a dollar and turn it into a dollar fifty or a dollar seventy or two dollars, um, the money will come, whether you create it for yourself or someone else wants to fund you. And uh, this is just one of the things that I, I think some entrepreneurs get stuck on. Well, you've also gotta be relentless. You have to just decide you're going to make it work. And I think Will made some good points here as well in that you know, when you're working on something, you have to decide it's going to work. And just say, look, I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm going to do trial and error and trial and error until it does work. And, and it will work. So, you know, again, like when you're building a, a, an e-commerce site, if that's the, the focus of this conversation, um, you build a website that, that if you find out you spent $1,000 in advertising on Google or $1,000 in advertising wherever else, and if it brings in $500 in that campaign, it doesn't mean you quit. It means you try something else. Maybe your landing page is wrong. Maybe your language is wrong. Maybe, maybe you're not offering a good enough value proposition. Maybe customers want something different than, than what you think they want. You keep making adjustments to your price points and you keep trial and error. And, and maybe next time you try it, you spend a thousand and it brings in 800. Maybe next time you spend a thousand, drop side down again. You keep trying until you spend that thousand on advertising and it brings in 1400. Well, now you got a money machine and then you just keep spending that thousand. Who here is working on a business that's got an e-commerce component? Hands up. Mima? No? It's a physical good, but... All right, keep your hands raised. Wait, I want to keep your hands raised for a little bit so I can see. Here in the front, what, what's, what's your name? Stand up and talk, tell us what your business is. Hi, uh, my name is Shannon Mears and I'm in University Drive and we have a DVD on getting into college and walking students and parents step by step through the college mission. All right, so talk a little bit about your business, the e-commerce component, and then I want these fellows up here to give you some advice on it. All right. Um, so where are you in the stage of the business? Are you selling the product? How are you selling the product? How's it all going so far? Yeah, we offer it through streaming. We're offering on Amazon, also on our website, University Drive. We do have a landing page, collegeadmissionsimplified.com. It is now not converting any sales rating, but 1,000 people, I think. Yeah, about a thousand hits a week without any conversions. So we're obviously having a problem there. Um, you can download it streaming on University Drive, and um, we've got a bunch of different distribution sources as well. Cool. All right. So, what general like thoughts or recommendations or questions do you have for her? My first question: What are you trying to give away so that people will be impressed and know that there's value behind whipping out their credit card and laying it down? Giving away in terms of the yeah, in terms of actual, wow, I went to this site, I signed in, wow, there's something here for me that I didn't have to pay for that makes me trust you. Um, yeah, we're giving away episode one, which is, you know, why go to college? And so we're sort of offering the dream of going to college. And so our whole concept is tapping into that pain that every parent is awake at night wondering how I'm going to send my kid to college. And the kid who's, you know, how do I get to Harvard? How do I get to Princeton? Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have a good call to action from there at the end of the video? At the end of the, on our website? Yes. There is not a call to action on episode one. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, the first thing I always see is uh, you work really hard, you think about what someone else's situation they're in, their problem, um, and then you offer up a lot of yourself, but then you don't ask for something in return. So make sure to ask, and it, 
for a lot of people, if they're not used to selling, it takes a while to do it with integrity and where it doesn't feel kind of scummy. So get yourself to a place where, look, I believe in the value that I'm offering. Here's what we're gonna do and lay out a very clear offer and in very clear terms in the video, what they're gonna do and what they're gonna get when they do it. Um, state the price of it, give them a, a risk-free trial that if it's not for them, it, it wouldn't work. Um, if it's not for them, then they could get their money back. Uh, the second thing I would try, and this is just out of left field, is I don't know who you're marketing at. You might be marketing at students, or you might be marketing at their parents, yes. and you should really think about that equation. I know someone who has a direct mail business that helps uh, children um, really succeed, and, and, and uh, it's actually an educational program. Um, that helps kids raise their GPAs and then they get into better colleges. So it's assisted uh, learning programs to help them with their unique abilities. And when he started this business, they were focusing on the students and trying to get students to raise their hands. And a year and a half into the business they had been spending and the business growth was flat, they switched to parents and they realized that the parents were the real drivers of these purchasing decisions who had money. And so they forgot about kids altogether and realized that parents were the ones with most pain. So how could they reach them? And they focused their direct mail campaign exclusively for parents. And then they actually branded their company to look like an official university type thing. So they have an insignia, a gold seal. Um, and they give away their offer for free and they give away content about it um, by sending a package to someone and says, your child is special and we know it. We're giving you away this free learning that's going to help them get X, X, and X. Now, once they go through this, here's the result they'll get. Would you like to enroll your child in our program so they'll also get this, this, and this? So now you've given a lot away. You've demonstrated social proof. And, um, and then there's that perceived value thing. So I don't know if you have that going on. So that's off the top of my head a couple of cool. ideas. So um, I'll take, keep your hands raised if you've got questions so I can see where you're at. I'm just going to want to call one more person. So Nima, you won the ticket. Stand up for a second. Nima uh, sent me a very cool product that he started working on. Tell the folks here a little bit about your product. Uh, you and I talked about being distributed in big stores, but I'm assuming you're also going to want to throw up a website and try to sell it. And I think the guys here can, uh, this, is a, this is a very intuitive thing that we might have all thought about. Um, and then the question is, how do you actually sell this and start making money on the e-commerce part of it? Hi guys, uh, well first of all, great discussion. And actually an IP attorney, so if any guys have any questions, feel free to uh, hit me up after the mixer. Uh, my product is a cell phone light. It's a wet light for your cell phones. All you guys have cell phones, they accumulate lights and germs. This is a fast, quick, and convenient way to safely clean your cell phone. So we offer peace of mind for the safety of your device. And uh, we help you keep your cell phone clean. clean. So, you know, we have to get healthy. Hygienic Solid pitch, I like it. Are you selling anything online yet? <laughs> we are selling online. We are definitely striking on a lot of the talking points what you're talking about. We're thinking about putting a portal where you can get one free wipe. It's a 50 cent or a dollar product in the mail. No questions asked, no credit card. So a little bit of giveaway. Real quick, how much how much do you sell the product for? Or, or if you come how much you sell the product for, how much you pay for it? Like what's the margin you got on this thing? Our margin, if anyone uh, um, manufactures this uh, consumer goods, you gotta go to China, so our margins are tenfold, or it could be online. So. Alright, so how does he blow out this business and get thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people buying his wife and just killing it? Well sell fear. That's what we did at the uh, <laughs> Like, I'm, I'm just so blatantly honest about this stuff. I spent almost 10 years in the pharmaceutical industry uh, with companies like Lilly Roche. Uh, Was that when you were 10 to 19? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what 10 year gap am I missing here? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, uh, pharmaceutical companies aren't the evil people they think they are. However, um, once, <laughs> once direct-to-consumer became big, it wasn't when we were doing it uh, early on, uh, our jobs were initially influencing docs, but once direct-to-consumer became big, the same formula um, came up. Um, do you have an ailment that of course you have, right? Are you sometimes tired? No, I'm never tired. You're, uh, wow, you know, like, uh, it's never happened before, right? Um, or, or, or show your child getting hit by a truck, right? Like, do you want this to happen to your child? Yes, I absolutely want that to happen to my child. You know, no, like, so they could be like, do you have a greasy face cell phone? No, that's exactly like, like, <laughs> no, who's got, who's got that commercial with the, uh, with the green monsters under your toenails? You remember that commercial? Oh, no, 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 you need to have a little green monster. Well, Jason, you know what I'm smoking, right? I'd tell everybody. Are you talking dirty? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, it's good. And, and so, so um, 
So besides, and Thomas selling fear, how does he act in that? Okay, how does so, he make, so, turn so that into money? W w what I'm trying to focus on though is the message. Um, okay. The fact that it has to do with your cell phone is, is secondary. The, the, the fact that um, you're going to get the bubonic plague by touching your cell phone is exactly the message, right? So you're going to places where you think people um, have, a, have a high um, uh, irritation or an in, infectious disease. You would literally go to places where people are seeking advice on uh, how do I uh, cure my, my kid from getting sick. Um, you're going to places where people are already freaked out about getting sick. Bingo, right? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying, but but um, you, your your market will self-identify in this case, right? Like, you, there's plenty of people who are already have the affliction. You just need to be where they are when they're pissing, you know, when they're upset about it. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's an e-commerce co component to that because I would think that why would people order it online, whereas they could? I'm just sorry, just being a realist. No, no, no. Um, the you know the the use of that I would think was people are on the go. So like when they're you know the gas start. station or convenience store where they need it there and well, maybe well, you have well, the, the first the one. scare signage you know but it might be the additional ones the refills if you will online well, but, well but, to, to keep, keep them in your purse or you know whatever if you have a purse. you got you guys continue the conversation afterwards all right so i saw some hands with some questions uh let's open up here my friend here with the glasses i don't think i've seen you here before raise your hand uh, stand up and say yeah. here so my name is people and uh the idea here is spot.com it's uh, it's actually the First, securitized online uh, market where you can go and rent out your own car. It means that it's a, it's kind of Zipcar. Everybody talks about Zipcar, just like this this idea. You don't need to invest on the cars, right? So it's uh, people out there that have their own cars that are renting out for other people. So the advantage of this business is lower prices because you're short circuiting. So just so I know ahead of time, are you are you talking about your business in general and to give you feedback or do you have a question? The question that I have here is that for people to rent out their own cars is a pretty involved idea. I'm not only selling I'm not just only selling a CD or, or a book, that is a pretty interesting uh, proposition, but my thing here is that I need to make people understand that the platform that we are building is secure. And uh, I'm not sure we fully understand how we're gonna we're going to do that in the future. Hmm. Is it my renting someone's car? You're renting your own car. So, so if, if, if I'm going to be on vacation for a week, I can rent my car to somebody for a week? That's mm -hmm. exactly what it is. Yeah. I don't think it's as much of a security issue as much as it is like a, a legal issue. You have to have good attorneys making sure you have good language in your, you know, to make sure the person doesn't rent your car, get in a car wreck, and you're liable. I mean, that's, that's probably your biggest issue. And then, of course, you know, trust, trusting the person to rent your car. <laughs> my, my thing is that we, we do have all that. I have a partner that has 10 years experience in the car rental so, business. So, Will, right since, can you speak to the security so. issue since you obviously have a lot of experience? Yeah, we went through this verbatim at Swap Police. Um, the, the idea of handing my keys over to you and you take my BMW for the next two years uh, freaks me out, right? Um, it, like, I mean, like, it, um, it's because there's, there's all this fear, uncertainty, and doubt of what will happen. In fact, we both sign one piece of paper, I hand you the keys, and in most cases I have no liability whatsoever, but there's no possible way you're gonna be able to, to communicate that on a landing page. Um, the reality is, uh, whenever you're dealing with sufficiently complicated products like that, um, you don't get the benefit of explaining the intricacies of the product on your initial sell page. All you get to respond to is, again, their, their pain point, their fear point. Um, it could be, do you need extra cash, right? Like, forget it for a second that um, this is about being able to list your car. If the answer is then yes, give us your email address, um, then you've pulled them into the process. You can then spend more time once you've got them past that initial hump to answer different questions because then, the, then the, their question tree becomes uh, more complicated. Uh, some people are gonna say, is it a complicated product? Some people are gonna say, how does it actually work? Meaning, how do I get my car there and back? Some people are gonna say, when do I get paid? Um, but you can't try to answer all of those questions in your landing page. Your landing page should answer one question that you know everyone will say yes to that's the are you tired question. And then, then bring them into the site, have some sort of payoff for them uh, you know, giving you an email address so you can continue the conversation even if they abandon. Um, and then start them down in decision trees. Say here's three popular questions people have for us and then spend time figuring out where people are going. So you can, you can kind of bubble up. If you have one. So what things do you do to address people's concerns about security? Um, okay, so, so. Or in his case, right? How do you yeah, address yeah. this? So uh, at Swap Lease, everyone had an issue of security. But it, it was secondary to their issue of can I get out of my car, right? So all of our initial mar marketing, I don't know what it is now, I haven't touched the site in years. 
Um, but all of our initial marketing was about you will get out of your car. And we had an amazingly high success rate at Swapples. Um, and so we realized that if people knew they could get out of their car, if they're sold on the value prop, they would later figure out um, you know, whether it was technically feasible. Um, once again, drugs work the same way. If you're sold on the, the, the fact that, um, that you're tired or you're sold on the fact that you're depressed, it's obviously complicated to go get a prescription and, and go through the rest of it, but they pulled you in on the value prop and then you'll spend time. If they flipped it and said, here's all the, the complications in getting a doctor's prescription, they would lose you. You have to pull somebody in on an answer that will always be yes initially. So in the back of the blue shirt, what was your name and what was your uh, question? Thanks. So I'm Mike Marodian and I run Campus Buddy. What it is, it's a site that has the you know, official grade distributions where a student in college can see you know, who's the easy professor, who's the hard one, how many A's and C's they give. I love it, dude. Why didn't I have this? <laughs> so we spent about a year making it. We've been giving it away for free for about a year since we put it up. Just the past month, we changed it to a, a premium model. Like, there's a lot of social features, but people come to see grades, and we want to, you know, we, nobody else really offers what we offer in that sense where you can see the official grades. So I'm wondering how should I market that to uh, effectively convert my user base? Do you have any videos of like the worst teachers? <laughs> Yeah, we, what do you mean, just like sneaking in their house when they're taking a shower? You know, what kind of videos of the teachers? No, exemplifying the teachers oh. you want to avoid. Okay. Um, you know, also, make people reflect on that. You know, the worst teachers they've had, and just imagine how miserable they were sitting through class every day. And so, are you asking the best way to monetize this business? Yeah. Um, how should I draw them in, basically? I'm most specifically concerned about the, the one, two, three po process of, you know, should I go on Google Ads? I mean, I have emails for these users. How, how should I go about um, converting at a much higher rate? Uh, you said you already have email addresses yeah, for a lot of the people? I do have a lot of emails. Okay, well, half of your, you know, the challenging half of your problem, I think, is already solved if that's the case. Uh, what you, I, I think, really need to focus on is what is the true value proposition of this service? Is it really that students find out what the grade is and that they avoid that teacher? Um, to me, I, you, I haven't gotten your full pitch, so I don't know, but it sounds like there's a lot of thinking and, and focusing you could do on understanding the real uh, desire of what students have when they're trying to figure that out and I think if you focus on that a little bit more you'll it'll become clear what the best opportunity is it might be yeah avoiding one teacher and, and getting another one and having an easier a um, but is there some related thing that's really driving what they're talking about um, and if you're gonna charge this as a subscription service um, I, I think you're really gonna need to focus on that so I, I feel like I'm uh, telling you your problem and not a solution right now. One of the um, things you may want to try to do also is you're aggregating data. You can give a little bit for free and then charge for the rest of it. So for example, if on a particular campus, there's a uh, hundred teachers this moment take, right? Or each student every semester, we're talking about college students, right? College yeah. students? Okay. So each semester someone's gonna take, or each quarter, they're gonna take five professors of the course, they're gonna take 15. Perhaps they can come on the site and then for free, they can see the grade distribution for one teacher and two teacher, but for every additional teacher, they have to pay some micropayment, like 99 cents. So you get to see two teachers that you search for for free, what their grade distribution is and how difficult they're rated, but then charge them for all the extra. So you give them a little bit of value up front, hook them, and get them to pay for something else. Cool? All right, so let's take about one more question for right now, and then we'll go through a couple announcements uh, over here in the blue, in the Teal, yeah. Okay. Um, I just was wondering how- Your, your name, the whole- Hi, my name is Joanna. Uh, quick question, I was just wondering how to get affiliates. There's a lot out there to be an affiliate, but I wanna know how to get your own affiliates. So you're saying you've got a product and you want someone to be an affiliate marker for you? Yeah. Sure, so I mean, is anyone here familiar enough with Commission Junction to talk about that or things like that? And Chance, I'm sure you know a bunch. <clears throat> um, first of all, affiliate marketers, stick together, and I mean that literally because they're kind of gooey. Um, <laughs> um, no, there's a lot, there's really networks, and I think 
there might have just recently been an affiliate uh, convention. It was in Vegas, but those happen every year. There's everyone's looking for the newest offer that anyone everyone else hasn't gotten. So if no one has your offer yet, that's part of your selling point that they could be the first to take it to market. And affiliate marketers generally have sources of traffic or lists or knowledge of keyword areas or they use Google or Yahoo or some specific search engine where they can dial up and get to work fast. So if part of your pitch in, in finding people is you can be the first to run our offer and not competitive, then that's, that's a selling point for you. But it, I would really recommend um, going to Affiliate Summit. Um, that's one of the clear places to do that and that's probably the biggest affiliate one. Um, there are the networks out there, Commission Junction being probably the, the best known. They're up in Santa Barbara. Yeah. Um, the challenge there is again getting attention for your offer. Um, the big thing affiliates just want to know is, is this going to be a, a good risk for my money? They're putting up money to do what you haven't been doing, which is the direct marketing of your business. Um, so what does your offer look like? So I would take a long hard look at what is your marketing now? Do you have a good landing page and a good sales conversion process that's already set up? So it's just plug and play for them. Yeah, um, and so Tony, you can more, but just real quick for those of you that may not know, uh, if you have a product or a service where there's some margin on it, right? Let's say you're, you're, there's an ebook that you've created and so you're selling for $30, maybe it's 100% margin, you know, you, could, you, you might be willing to say, hey, I'll give you, if you can sell this for $30, I'll give you 20, I'll give 10, maybe I'll give you 10, whatever the economics are for you. You can go to networks like Commission Junction, you put in your offer, you typically, with them, have to give a $3,000 deposit, and then you, what you do is you have to commit that you're gonna have $500 a month worth of sales. It's basically, in essence, a sophisticated bulletin board where affiliate marketers go and look at all the different offers that people have, and then they can pick your offer, and if your offer converts well because you've got a good product and a good landing page, they'll use it and they can be generating money for you. Tony, anything you wanted to add or ask? Um, two things, Chance said an affiliate summit in a couple of months, actually in about a month and a half, there's PubCon in Vegas, mm -hmm. yeah. and a lot of affiliate marketers go to that, so that might be a good investment just to spend the money and mm -hmm. go meet a bunch of people. Um, the second thing is figure out who in the industry is a big affiliate marketer for your specific vertical or niche, because I mean, if you, if you guys have ever heard of thesis, the WordPress theme, one of the biggest affiliate marketers that I know, is her name's Ray Hoffman, as soon as she started talking about thesis, and as soon as she started putting the affiliate stuff together on her blog, every other SEO that was out there started doing it, and it blew up the entire theme. So the same type of thing with the video. Cool. All right, I'll, so- um, we'll email me because yeah. I have a lot of contacts. And yeah. I yeah. Sure. So real quick, are you, are you guys okay sharing some of your general contact information? How can people get a hold of you, Chance? Sure, uh, Twitter, at Chance Bar. Um, and Chance what? at Chance Bar, my last name is Barnett, so it's B-A-R, Chance Bar, um, and then my blog, chancebarnett.com. Mine is willschroeder.com, just W-I-L-S-C-H-R-O-T-E-R.com, and all my contact info on it. My email's dan at perfectbusiness.com, uh, my, uh, my blog is danwbliss.com, and, uh, and that's also my Twitter account, at danwbliss. Cool. So uh, I think the three of you are just incredible examples of folks that, you know, without having a lot of resources to start off with, are real life proof that you can build extremely successful businesses that make money from day one. I've been very thankful for both all the knowledge that you guys have shared with us and just our friendship. And really, guys, thank you so much for coming out. If you join me.